Samuel 30, and then uh, we'll start in verse number 1. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and Ziklag. Attacked Ziklag, burned it with fire, and had taken captive the women and those who were there from great, from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was burned with fire, and their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with them lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives, Anaim and the Jezreelite, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, had been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him. Because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abiathar, the priest, Amalek's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. Now we will be in Second Samuel, chapter number 1. Then 1 through 10. Now it came to pass after the death of Saul, when David had returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David had stayed two days in Ziklag. On the third day, behold, it happened that a man came from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dust on his head. So it was when he came to David that he fell to the ground and prostrated himself. And David said to him, Where have you come from? So he said to him, I have escaped the camp, of the, is, uh, the camp of Israel. Then David said to him, How did the matter go? Please tell me. And he answered, The people have fled from the battle. Many of the people are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. So David said to the young man who told him, How do you know that Saul and Jonathan, and his son, are dead? I happen to be on Mount Gilba, the young man said, and there was Saul leaning on his spear with the chariots and the riders almost upon him. When he turned around, he saw me. He called out to me, and I said, what can I do? Uh, verse number nine. Then he said to me, stand over me and kill me. I am at the throes of death, but I am still alive. So I stood over him and killed him because I was sure that he could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown that was on his head and the bracelet that was on his arm and have brought them here to my Lord. I have brought them here to my Lord. Hallelujah. Psalm 65, 11 declares that you crown the year with your bounty and your carts overflow with abundance. And I believe that the Spirit of God bears witness in both you and I that God has not only crowned this calendar year, but he has crowned this season. He has crowned this season. The crown is coming. The crown being the manifestation of God's promise, of his purpose, of his goodness, of his favor. The crown is coming. But it's not just that the crown is coming but it's about where it is coming. For the crown did not come to David in, Zik, uh, to, in, David to, in the palace, but rather the crown came to him in Ziklag. And the Bible says, after the slaughter of the Amalekites, David stayed, it came back to Ziklag and stayed there two days. He stayed there two days, and on the third day, after two days in Ziklag, the crown came. Two days waiting in ashes. Two days waiting in the aftermath of Ziklag. Two days. 
waiting in uncertainty two days there two days waiting you don't even know what you're waiting on but you're waiting something you sense but you're waiting can't explain it but two days he waited in Ziklag and the crown came we have toned this series the crown is coming but within the context of that message, I want to talk to you from the subject in the moments before. In the moments before. Two days in Ziklag. Let's, whether we are talking about Joseph in the prison the night before he is summoned by Pharaoh and elevated to the position as ruler of all of Egypt, or we're talking about David two days in Ziklag before the crown came. It, it always fascinates me to ponder over what was going through their minds in the moments before. In the moments before breakthrough, in the moments before promise, in the moments before the crown. Because if you look at the reality that is, is in front of them in the moments before, things look so far away from anything resembling promise. And, and they, I'm sure by every, uh, by every indication, they most likely felt as far as they looked. And, and I can't help but to imagine the inner conversations between their heads and their hearts between the, the, the conflict between hope and logic. The, 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 you're, you're, you're holding on to faith while at the same time you're wrestling with the present moment. And I can't help but to wonder where the scales of despair were tipping inside of them. Because they, like many of us, are, 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 are in these predicaments and situations that if you begin to calculate it in your mind, you begin to feel so far. But all the while, they're right at the fringes of their promise. Right, right on the edge of their breakthrough. And I draw encouragement I can't help but they get excited because I draw encouragement from the fact that it is possible to feel that far, yet to be so close. That, that it encourages me because it, it, it lets me know that I don't have to bow down to the testimony of the moments. That I am not crazy, that I'm not out of my mind to, to, to participate and devote myself to hope. Are you, am I the only person that, 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 that you look at things and you wonder, am I hoping in vain? I, am I waiting in vain? Am I, am I foolish? But sometimes hope will look foolish for a moment. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Sometimes hope will look foolish, but for a moment. But I thank God that his word says that we have a hope in him that does not disappoint. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And I, I, I draw comfort that you can feel, you, you can feel it. You can feel it. You can feel it. You don't want to admit it, but you feel it. You smile on the outside, but you feel it. But I thank God that my feelings are not necessarily always true. That, that I can feel one way. But right on the other end of the equation, something is coming. And so, and so the scripture does not divulge to us what was going through David's mind the two days in Ziklag before the crown. But there is something that provides us with some general insights of his state of mind, at least towards Ziklag itself, that we can sort of glean some things from. Can we, can we go into it? It is in David's inquiry of God in verse 8 of 1 Samuel 30. He says, so David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? That 
it's, it's interesting, interesting. Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I, hmm, shall I overtake them? Shall I overtake them? Now, there's so much wealth and dimension in David's question that we can draw from that will, will actually, in the end, will take us a couple of Sundays to, to, to sort of move through. But, but, but I have to imagine, I, ha- I have to imagine that in one sense, I have to believe that this is not an issue of David's confidence and in his ability to overtake the Amalekites. He does not, and what I'm trying to say, he does not lack confidence in his ability to fight because David is a fighter. Oh, he wrote poetry, he sang songs, but don't let that fool you. <laughs> he could take up the sword as well as he could take up the harp. The, 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 even he, the enemy knew there is one person you don't want to cross swords with, you don't want to mess with David. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? And le- least you forget, this is the same David who, from his youth, while he was taking care of his father's sheep, had on occasion both lion and bear come and, 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 and steal one of the sheep. And David would take off after it and killed it, snatched the sheep out from its mouth and brought it back with his bare hands. This is David who ran after Goliath while everybody was running from Goliath with nothing but a sling and a stone. This is the same David, whom when Saul thought to kill him, he gave him a suicide mission and said, bring me back the 100 foreskins of the Philistine foreskins. And David went out and he didn't come back with 100. He came back with 200, threw it at Saul's feet and said, what's next? Saul could, I mean, David could fight. I mean, he could fight. You do not want to mess with David. And so this was not a question that emanated out of his lack of confidence in his ability to fight. He could fight. But rather, it was a question of frustration. Frustration. It, it, it was more of, God, should I even bother to do anything about this? Should, should I even bother God? Is it worth it? Is it worth it? In other words, it was not, it was not that he lost his ability to fight. It's that he lost his reason to fight. And you see, sometimes when the enemy knows he cannot defeat or overcome your ability, he will come after your cause because he knows if he comes after your cause, if he steals your cause, your abilities and giftings and strengths will become as good as nothing. See, because we, we make a lot about people's giftings and people's abilities. And, but, but, but let me tell you something. You can have giftings and abilities, but without, but, but without a cause, your gifting and abilities will take you nowhere. That we, we take a certain route every morning as we, we're dropping the kids to school and going to work. And you see these day laborers and, and, and they're on the side and they're waiting to be hired. And they have all of these tools. They have axes and saws and drills and all of this equipment. They're waiting there. They have all the tools but no calls. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? And no matter how strong your tools are, no matter how well equipped you are. None of your equipment, none of your giftings, none of your strength mean anything without a cause. In the same token, in the same token, you can have a cause. If you can connect to a cause, you will find giftings and abilities and strengths in you that you did, inside of you. It will draw out of you what you didn't even know that you had inside of you. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? That, that even when, you, when the Bible talks about David's mighty men, you, you, and it talks about their, the, all the heroics they performed, and you, you, you hear about these men, these men of valor, these men of gifting. But the Bible says that right bef- before that, before they met David, these were disgruntled, bitter, empty, in debt. These were the same people, but when a cause comes into your life, the cause will draw things out of you you didn't even know you had in you. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Jesus said to Peter, remember he said to Peter, he said, now you fish for fish, 
but follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. In other words, Peter, I'm not going to give you greater gifts, but what I'm going to give to you is a greater cause. And when the cause, when, when, when I give you the greater cause, the cause will bring your gifts into a dimension and in height that you never even imagined. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I said, I'm not going to change your gifting. I'm just going to change your cause. I'm not going to give you a greater gift. I'm going to give you a greater cause. And the cause will take you to places that your gifting could not. Your giftings will perform and do things that they, you would never imagine they could do by itself. Because it is not so much how great your gift is, but how great your cause is. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? That the cause is everything. Turn to your neighbor and tell them the cause is everything. Hallelujah. Sometimes the greatest crown God can give to you is a cause. Esther had a crown, but she had no cause. And Mordecai came to her and said, he said to her, who knows? Who knows? But for such a time as this, as you rose in royal position, in other words, Mordecai was saying to Esther, Esther, you have the position, you have the crown, but you have no cause. You have no cause. And what made Esther great was not the crown, but it is the cause that made her crown great. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Are you following what I'm saying to you? The cause, the cause, it is the cause that makes you great. Not your gifting, not your ability. It is the cause that makes you great. Not your name, not your titles, not your positions. All of that is meaningless without a cause. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Lots of people. See, it's possible. Some of you, it's possible to have so much gifting and so much ability and you're sitting on it because you have no cause. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The cause, the cause will take you places. The cause will cause things to come out of you. That's why the enemy will do anything to separate you from your cause. He will use objects of frustration, disappointment, fear, and bitterness, all to sever the cause from your heart. It's not that you're not strong. It's not that you're not gifted. It's not that you don't have ability. The issue is your heart has been severed from cause. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Your heart's been divorced of cause. Sometimes you have to fight to get back your cause, not your stuff. That's what the enemy was after when he was coming after Ziklag. That was what he was after with, with David. Because, because the enemy knew that, 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 the enemy knew that if, if David received the crown but had no cause, the crown would be meaningless. So he came to Ziklag not to come after his stuff. That is not what he really lost. He lost cause. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? That, 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 that sometimes... It's not the stuff, but what the stuff represents. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That, that sometimes the enemy knows where the trophies of your hope are. The trophies of your faith. The objects of where, you, 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 you know, the, these little things in your life, they're not the full manifestation. They're the seed of your hope. And you put, and, it, and it, they represent the hope. It's in seed form. But, but, but the enemy knows these trophies that we have. And Ziklag is where David's trophies were. It, it was where his trophies were. It's where all his stuff was that, 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 that had meaning to him. And now the enemy, when he touched that, he, 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 he was attacking David's cause. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? What's interesting is, what's interesting is that the Bible says David and his men wept until they could not. Now, men, talk to me. For us, women, we, I love you, but we all know, I mean, you guys can cry at a heartbeat. You know. <laughs> and, and for men, we, we, we get intimidated by emotions. We're we are, we're physically strong, emotionally. We, we don't go there. <laughs> and 
to, to get a man to weep to that extent. And, and I have to remind you, these are warriors. These are warriors. These are people who know how to fight. The Bible talks about all the crazy things these men have done. One of them, Benaiah, says he jumped into a pit on a snowy day with a lion with nothing but a club in his hands. These people are not no trivial people. These were, you don't mess with these guys. These guys were men's men. Just go look for Why would you jump into a pit with a lion? The lion was even coming. It was in a pit. He jumped down after it, looking for a fight. <laughs> Forget trying to fight. He went looking for it. He said, Come, let me we jump down there. To, and the Bible says none of them had died. Their, their sons, are, they're all alive. I would think if you were, I, I mean, you, you and I, you, you look at that scripture and you may look, but these were fighters. These, these people were, were, were trained for war. They, they, these were bad men. And, and you tell me that someone's took my son, I'm going to go after you. So I begin to wonder, why are they crying like someone died? And it shows me something died. You just don't see it. The cause. The cause. Something perished. You didn't see it. You, it doesn't make sense until you understand it was something more than just the stuff. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? But I just sense a Mordecai spirit coming to this place. That what the Mordecai did for Esther, the Holy Spirit wants to do right now. Which is awaken a cause in your heart. Which is to revive a cause in your heart. To revive visions. To re drive, revive dreams. To revive these things. The enemy has come into your life to rob you of the cause. And I just hear the Holy Spirit says, I want to revive dreams inside of you. I want to, I want to resurrect vision inside of you. I want to awaken a cause within your soul. I want to awaken a cause within your heart. I want to awaken your imagination. To open up. To conceive dreams to conceive thoughts, to conceive of how, are you hearing what I'm saying to you? I just feel that the same thing that Mordecai did for Esther, the Holy Spirit is tapping your heart right now and saying, if for such a time as this, I want to awaken a cause within your heart. I want to awaken a cause inside of you. Hallelujah. And so David inquires of God. God, should I even try to recover this situation? Or should I just quit here? To truly understand where David is coming from, you have to see Ziklag from David's perspective. Ziklag was David's attempt to build a life of contentment.